morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. So, we are discussing features of the novel and we are talking about the modern novel and its criticism. We are going to talk about fantasy, right. The essence of the modern novelist lies in not succeeding to achieve what they attempt. Uh, we are talking about E. M. Foster's work aspects of the novel uh, and Foster says that the uh, aims and uh, ambitions of the modern novelist is never quite uh, straightened or out or never quite uh, uh, determined from beforehand. Uh, to quote Foster, he says, uh, trying to lay an egg and being told you have produced a paraboloid. Uh, more curious than gratifying. That is how the experience of the modern novelist is. Uh, and sometimes this creation, this production of the paraboloid happens at the cost of the death of the hen. Uh, so, here uh, when we talk about the death of the hen, we are reminded of uh, Holabach's, uh, you know, proposition about the death of the author. We are uh, actually entering into the realm of post-structuralism where in order for a modern work to happen, in order for it to be read and uh, uh, interpreted and reinterpreted in various ways, the author needs to uh, die. The uh, logocentrism, the author's only meaning, uh, dominant meaning has to go. So, this par paraboloid uh, that is created, something that the author wants to create and something that is created instead, uh, this entire experience is more curious. The author is also a seeker uh, and, and uh, you know, pursuing uh, the end along with the reader and uh, it is not a very gratifying process. It contains the lack the human flaw that defines human existence uh, or life, right? Uh, and uh, the author has to go, like I said. But this is how modern novel is uh, pursued. The modern novel has no predetermined uh, goal, uh, you know, uh, defined or uh, conceived from beforehand. If a trajectory is set forth beforehand, the journey and struggle of the author becomes uh, false or superficial. So, the relation between the artwork and its criticism through theorization is also something uh, that uh, contains a, uh, a gap between what the artwork is and how it is interpreted. Uh, there can be no reconciliation. The two are always happening on two different planes. Um, here, E. M. Foster would say, I quote, criticism, especially a critical course, can be misleading. However lofty its intentions and sound its method, its subject slides away from beneath it, unquote. So, the critic might carry on in a significantly intelligent and intelligible manner. But in certain regions which have nothing to do uh, with anything that has been said by the author. So, there are two ways of looking at this. One is like the post-structuralists would say there is no such thing called the original meaning or the author's intention. There is no way of going back to the author's intention. There are only multiple derivative meanings uh, that, that emerge through rereading of a text where every reader becomes a writer and there is no such thing as the author, the godlike author, right. Now, on the other hand, E. M. Foster would say that a criticism can bloom, it can uh, evolve uh, in its own essence, it can follow its own trajectory, it can be a very good piece of writing in its own right, uh, but it can, uh, you know, take on or it can, uh, uh, it can happen on a different plane altogether, which is uh, different from the original work. To quote Foster, when we try to translate truth out of one sphere into another, whether from life into books or from books into lectures, so when we are actually moving from one plane 
of discussion to another, something happens to truth. It goes wrong, not suddenly when it might be detected, but slowly." Unquote. So, a piece of writing happens uh, on its own. So, there are, there are two things in classroom one could do. One is just read out from the book and then uh, experience the work firsthand. And so, there could be uh, 10 different interpretations even when 10 people are reading a work together. The other is directly understanding the work through criticism, which is uh, however, uh, you know, comprehensive, lucid and uh, well written the criticism or the critic is, it is uh, definitely uh, shifted or moved away from the original work. So, criticism or critique uh, or a lecture on any work is always happening uh, evolving on a different plane from the work itself. Fiction always makes some sort of demand on the reader, right? What are the demands that a fiction could make? Curiosity, human feelings such as happiness, uh, pathos, sense of value for the characters. So, once we read, we move along uh, the plot, we feel for the character, we have certain values that we develop for the characters in the fiction as well as intelligence and memory. These are some of the, uh, we could say, sophisticated tools that uh, are required of a, uh, a reader of the modern fiction. Now, I am going to quote uh, at length from E. M. Foster uh, what he says regarding fantasy and prophecy. Uh, this is a new topic that he is introducing in the aspects of the novel. Uh, he says, he, he refers to or he introduces, he defines fantasy and prophecy as follows. I quote, there is more in the novel than time or people or logic or any of their derivatives, more even than fate. And by more, I do not mean something that excludes these aspects, nor something that includes them, embraces them. I mean something that cuts across them like a bar of light that is intimately connected with them at one place and patiently illumines all their problems and at another place shoots over or through them as if they did not exist. We shall give that bar of light two names, fantasy and prophecy." Unquote. Right. So, here we understand that just like the light in a room, uh, fantasy and prophecy are not uh, separately visible in any plot, but all the characters, the turn of events, uh, the way the plot, you know, churns out, the way the plot is shaped is illumined because of this all uh, pervasive uh, light in the room or in the plot, which is uh, fantasy or prophecy. So, the characters, the plots, everything are shown, they come to picture uh, colored by, tinted by and uh, deeply enmeshed with the uh, fantastic or the prophetic meaning. The fantasy or the prophecy do not, uh, you know, uh, exist uh, as uh, individual separate entities. Everything else uh, is uh, seen in the light of uh, these elements, right. So, fantasy and prophecy in a novel uh, reflect temporality, human behavior and causality in a new light that takes away their routine nature. So, there are two things. The characters are illumined by or through the elements of the fantastic and the prophetic and then the, the fantastic and the prophetic element uh, supersedes and becomes, you know, more than, greater than 
the sum total of all the characters and all the events uh, brought together. The mundaneness, the routineness, the ordinariness is taken away because the fantastic or the prophetic is somewhere present in the uh, storytelling, right? So, they influence characters and events, but they become more than, they become bigger than and they encompass the entire cosmos. Uh, they make it fantastic, right? Uh, so, everything is shown in a new light, uh, which takes away their uh, ordinary or routine nature. Beyond the actions in the plot, the work becomes a fantastic or a prophetic novel, uh, regardless of or notwithstanding the events that are taking place, we understand that we are in the realm of the fantastic. Uh, the reality is an upturned one, it is the fantastic reality. So, fantasy asks of the reader to accept that the book is not real uh, in the naturalist or realist sense and thereby it tests the reader's resilience in accepting what they cannot immediately relate or identify with. So, will the reader uh, go along with the plot? Will the reader withdraw their concession and stop reading or continue reading uh, with a certain degree of uh, skepticism or skeptical aloofness? Or, or will the reader uh, let himself or herself be carried away with the flow of fantasy, uh, which is, uh, you know, which in the third uh, event or in the third instance, the reader is required to actually give up on moral positions of believing or not believing or give up on the parameters of real and uh, unreal, uh, unlearn the, the conditions and parameters of real and unreal that they have grown up with, even the uh, uh, traditional expectations of the reader from the novel need to be revisited and drastically, radically, uh, you know, uh, altered, uh, uh, refashioned, right. So, uh, readership, uh, expectations of the reader, sense of time, sense of space, uh, sense of what is true and untrue or, or not true, uh, natural, supernatural, everything is revisited and reshuffled. The meanings are uh, drastically shifted in uh, works of fantasy and prophecy, especially when we are talking about fantasy, this holds true. Fantasy entails taking off from the literal world and treating a work of art through its endless fictional possibilities. So, some possibilities that might not work uh, within uh, the realm of, uh, within, uh, so some, uh, you know, possibilities that might not work in everyday life uh, could happen within the space of uh, fiction. And how far is the re reader uh, ready uh, to, to go along with the author uh, and the author's, you know, uh, fantastic imagination in writing. Uh, uh, and, and participate in this journey. That makes one a successful uh, or a failed reader or a not so successful reader of uh, the fantasy genre. So, being too comfortable in the literal world of realism or naturalism, once we are very ensconced, uh, very uh, comfortable with the parameters that have been set by realism and naturalism, the fantastic can uh, have several, uh, you know, uh, impact on the reader. It could thrill the reader uh, or uh, conversely, it could choke her. So, the fantastic basically tests how much the reader can uh, adjust with the alternate uh, meanings, alternate uh, realities. The reader's Training is to recognize the fantastic as such, not to judge it, not measure it through the laws of daily life. Uh, so, how much can we adjust with the oddness of the fantastic as a method or a subject matter? How much are we willing to kind of uh, 
go with the flow. The readers that cannot reciprocate to the fantastic do not have a poor imagination or a basic dislike for literature in general. Rather, they simply cannot stretch themselves to certain demands that are being made on the reader by uh, literature. So, literature has expanded itself or, or altered itself, shifted itself to accommodate the fantastic. Uh, now, it is for the reader to shuffle or, or uh, revisit his or her position and uh, assumptions and expectations. So, sometimes the reader does not object uh, the, the introduction of the fantastic elements in a work, but uh, they are left a little uh, dissatisfied after the reading because they could not go with the flow of the writing. They have suspected the, uh, uh, the, the plausibility of such a plot because all along they have been uh, uh, they have been uh, reading a work of fan fantasy through the prism of through the criteria set by uh, realism or naturalism and that is not the way to go about it. Fantasy and prophecy illumine objects with much more vividness than any commonplace or mundane perspective uh, ever could. Right? So, both fantasy and prophecy are bound by a sense of mythology and yet we would see that the gods in each of them are very different from the other. They differ in how humans interact with the larger supra or transhuman forces that lie beyond the human world. Fantasies gods come as a suggestion and they do not confront the ordinariness or the ordinary existence. They are less grand. So, fantasies gods are uh, almost part and parcel of our everyday, uh, everyday being, everyday existence. There could be the fantastic in little everyday things. Fantasy derives its charm from improvisation, spontaneity, inventiveness. Right. So, there is no uh, concept of the grand uh, or the great god, the one god, there are just demigods. So, uh, fa fantasy brings in the otherworldly affairs and yet uh, these uh, otherworldly affairs, the supernatural do not confront us. They are not uh, happening uh, in an expressed or grand manner. So, uh, E. M. Foster would note that Hermes, who is the god of luck, fertility, or thieves, rule fantasy. Right. So when we talk of God, we talk of morality, we talk of sin, and all the superlative qualities that need to be achieved. So God is the concentrate of all the superlative qualities. But how about a god of thieves? That topsy turvy is the entire assumption with which we the, the entire assumption or assumptions that we take to the meaning of God, right? So, a God that could give us luck, fertility, and also the craft of theft. That kind of a God rules fantasy. He is the cleverest of all gods. So, could one suggest that fantasy is about? the dexterity, the skill of the author's mind that touches on the ordinary, uh, the everydayness uh, like a fairy or a fairy or a clever elf, it could be a gnome or more like a shape-shifting trickster, a god that is very protean, very shape-shifting, a very clever uh, you know, presence in the plot, which is like a quicksilver almost. So, fantasy questions the totality of our knowledge of what our culture regards as real. Could there be a totality of knowledge or can we constantly play around with it? 
uh, could we introduce something new so that the totality that we hitherto had gets unsettled and needs to accommodate new meanings, new things. Fantasy is constantly uh, challenging, confronting and contesting with that kind of totality of knowledge or meaning and its aim is to uh, allow the author opportunities for uh, satire through uh, revisiting traditionally accepted parameters of reality. In Freudian criticism, fantasy as a literary phenomenon is a neat record of an imaginary achievement, fulfillment of a wish, a correction of unsatisfied reality. So, according to James McConkey, I quote McConkey, fantasy is a device by which the writer achieves the creation of a backdrop distinct from phenomenal reality, a mythology suitable to contain the author's own values, unquote. So, on the one hand, we have some pre-existing values on which uh, they are like the meta values, the grand values on which entire community, entire society has agreed upon and then the author is imposing his own set of values to, uh, you know, um, play with the pre-existing ones. Uh, that's from, from that kind of an interaction, a contestation, fantasy churns out. Construed far from its ordinary meaning, uh, E.M. Foster understands prophecy on the other hand as a literary technique which serves neither as an agent of foretelling, foretelling of the future, uh, nor as an appeal for righteousness. So, when E. M. Foster is using prophecy, prophecy is not synonymous with foretelling of future or uh, having any uh, hint or inkling of uh, righteousness. Rather, what uh, E. M. Foster would uh, say is that prophecy is a music-like quality an ascent in the novelist's voice. Its uh, theme is uh, the universe or something universal. So, once the prophetic is introduced to a plot, the, the pitch or the tonality of narration changes. It goes on to a different plane only to come back to the ordinary, right. There is a music-like quality that is introduced to uh, narration by virtue of prophecy. Um, and uh, such prophecy as Foster understands could rest on, as he says, I quote him, any of the faiths that have haunted humanity, Christianity, Buddhism, dualism, Satanism and so forth. So, unquote. Uh, further, Wilfred Stone notes that Foster's notion of prophecy uh, realize the spirit embedded in the phenomenal world, the effect of which, uh, to quote Stone, argues the compatibility of human and absolute values and provides needing places for the dualisms of his aesthetics and his art, unquote. So, Tristram Shandy is a work of fantasy. We would like to uh, discuss now how Tristram Shandy by Stern holds the fantastic element. This work by Stern comprises a hodgepodge of digressions which leads to labyrinths, afterthoughts, delays and apologies. Critics have often questioned if uh, Tristram Shandy is a complete work. Uh, it is often read, popularly read as unfinished. While Stern planned to produce multiple volumes, later critics uh, see a careful pattern in his madness and uh, this recklessly compounded writing. Questions of form and structural unity cannot be brought to the understanding of uh, uh, Tristram or rather cannot adequately understand or, uh, you know, uh, encompass uh, the meanings, the ambitions of the author. Uh, in the fragmented narrative, very little of Tristram's life is narrated. So, the fantastic in Tristram Shandy lies in the order of the form. The fantastic is in the different parts that are not relating in any fundamental way to one another. 
A critic like Walter Begot would say that Tristram Shandy is, to quote Begot, a book without plan or order whose greatest defect is, I quote again, the fantastic uh, disorder of the form. To quote a critic like Walter Begot, uh, Tristram Shandy is, I quote, a book without plan or order, unquote, whose greatest defect is, I quote again, the fantastic disorder of the form, unquote. Again, Ernest Baker says that Stern produced, uh, I quote uh, Baker, Salmagandhi of odds and ends recklessly compounded, unquote. So, Tristram Shandy was published in five parts over a period of more than seven years. Some of the later parts contain materials that Stern could not have known at the time when he began to write this work, the first volume or the first part. Uh, and this points to the work's unplanned composition. Some later critics, uh, however, suggest that large parts of the work has been planned uh, with more care than Stern's public uh, attitude would actually suggest. This is something I have mentioned before also. The work, uh, like the later critics, uh, see a careful pattern through this recklessness and uh, madness that has been posited by uh, or the mad position, the, the, the position of the mad author that, uh, you know, Stern uh, you know, assumes, posits uh, through writing Tristram Shandy. John Trugot observes that, uh, I quote Trugot, ontological, vast, abrupt, the abyssum between ideas and reality, unquote, is present uh, in this novel by Stern. Tristram Shandy has less to do with the epistemological question of how accurately our ideas reflect reality than with the ethical uh, question of how uh, our ideas affect our ability to bear, to uh, face up to or come in terms with reality. Throughout Tristram Shandy, Stern projects a spontaneous writing which is least inhibited by plan or form. Stern is preoccupied with the instability, the unsettledness of language as well as the linguistic embarrassment uh, which draws attention to the blank spaces uh, of uh, the curses, where the curses have been used. And these blank spaces suggest that any name could be asserted. Playing with the names is something that also shows in the chain of mistakes that lead to uh, Tristram's uh, christening. Stern's subversion of literary form reappears uh, through his uh, black page trick. Critics call it the black page trick, something that cannot be justly reproduced uh, through or reproduced in reprints. Similarly, Stern inserts his preface, the preface of this novel, somewhere midway through volume 3. And even the dedication is delayed till chapter 7 of the first volume. So, Stern subverts uh, reason and rationality and pursues the uh, moral grounds of his reader to reconcile with the eccentricities or the oddities of the Shandy world. So, in order, that is how the fantastic is read. In order for the reader to be able to understand or get uh, uh, into the cosmos of uh, offered, uh, cosmos offered by Tristram Shandy, they have to shed behind, they have to uh, unlearn some of the social conventions that they have uh, uh, grown up observing and learning. Life's secret springs are mentioned as well as the hidden resources. The secret springs and hidden resources enable the mind to bear the or cope up with the overwhelming forces of reality what reality demands of us, how reality imposes itself on us. Fencing against the minor evils of daily living and this refers to the myriad 
misfortunes that have befallen Tristram. And uh, they add uh, something to this fragment of life. Right. So, throughout Tristram Shandy, there are sartorial metaphors uh, that illustrate the characters' never ending struggles to shield themselves from external evils. It could be the reality. For example, the novel keeps uh, mentioning and talking about buttoning and unbuttoning vexations, which is comic and uh, they have a satirical uh, undertone as well. So, critics comment that Tristram Shandy is more a comedy than a satire on the human situation. Its incidental satire makes its doctrine of sympathy artistically necessary. That kind of satire which is necessary to uh, drive the uh, comedy, uh, drive the comedy well. Uh, Stern's work of comedy is as uh, salutary to the life force, it, 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 it celebrates the life force as it is deadly to any premise of reason and rationality. Ian e. Foster says that Tristram Shandy is a fantastic work. It's a fantasy in which a fantastic god called Muddle renders everyday life chaotic. Stern adapts Jonathan Swift's technique in conjuring a chaotic world where reason functions only to alienate and confuse. One is uh, disoriented through reason. Only through shunning reason and rationality can one be uh, oriented back into the Shandy world, the world of fantasy. So, shunning uh, reason becomes one of the premises uh, for reading Stern's work. The appeal of the fantastic is personal. So, the reader can either accept the supernatural or not accept it. But the fantastic may not be uh, engaged adequately if one approaches it only through a universal critical apparatus. With this, I am going to stop today's lecture here and let us meet in another lecture with another round of discussions. Thank you.